in your opening, you noted the fact that you uh, served in the state legislature and um, during the 2008 recession. And Children's Alliance has taken a position that the legislature must not cut any child programs in a way that we did back in 2008 when you were in the legislature. What are some of the lessons that you learned from that experience that uh, inform how you would talk to legislators this time around? What did we learn? Well, we learned that it's dumb to make long-term cuts in the whole system and that you have to think about how are you gonna grow your way out of the problem? You, you do need to figure out a way to have revenue and expenditures be reasonably in balance because the pathway that spending a whole bunch more than you take in leads is, is not a good one for smaller governments that, that don't have their own currency. And we don't and aren't going to have our own currency. Um, so it's, uh, so, I, being, we tried at the time to be really thoughtful. Um, what, one lesson I would give is that it's better if you, um, if your negotiating partner is more lined up with your particular interests, uh, you know, because you've got to get both the House and the Senate, and they were controlled by different groups at the time uh, and different parties, and that caused some tension. And that's about as far as I can go to talking about elections during the, um, during the workday. Uh, but I think that elections do matter. Uh, I think we'll have a little bit different makeup coming into this one. Uh, but you've got to really think about how, what are the long-term implications? So there were a bunch of really terrible things that happened during that recession. Uh, and I would say that the damage we did to the mental health system was one of them. Uh, one of the joys though that we had in the 2010 uh, session was bargaining um, the Medicaid expansion. So we came out of that recession with two changes, structural changes in Washington that have made an enormous difference. We, we put the law in place that inexorably created the McCleary solution, uh, which has really made education funding both more adequate and more fairly distributed uh, across the state. And we came out with the Medicaid expansion uh, the whole Obamacare implementation, uh, which is covering three quarters of a million, a million more people in Washington than we were covering before that recession with pretty good health care. So I think you can use, we should use these recessions, the time when everyone is really upset that they have to make cuts and they're going to make cuts. Um, and, you know, we can have a position that they should not cut any programs that have the word child in their name. But the reality is, is that they're going to do that because they don't have a lot of choice. Um, and, but let's make sure that we don't do what we did to the mental health system, that we don't do what we did to the foster care system. We froze rates um, for a decade and we, we lost a ton of providers and we basically, you had to take a vow of poverty in order to provide service to kids in foster care. And that's not a reasonable thing to do. So those freezings that didn't have an automatic unfreezing are, are really difficult. Uh, that would be one of the things that, that we're now trying to recover. The mental health recovery is going to take years more than where we are today because we bankrupted that system. You're still muted. Okay. So for those who um, are not tracking the state financial system right now, um, I know when I came on board um, in the early part of the summer, we were looking at an $8 billion budget deficit in the upcoming session. And that number has been cut in half because of uh, increasing revenues that are coming into the state coffers. But still $4 billion is not a small amount of money to try to um, end the session with a balanced budget. And so um, what are the impacts that you're anticipating in your, in your department? So well, I wanna temper your optimism here a little bit too, um, in that 
we really have no idea what the economy is going to do. We have a, one of the best forecasting systems in the country. Uh, and forecasting works really well when the world stays in a consistent way. But when you have crazy upheavals like we did in 2008, the worst recession since the depression at that time, this one's worse. Uh, and we learned. And so the eviction moratorium is going to make an enormous, it's making an enormous difference. Uh, the the uh, money we spent on uh, unemployment insurance made an enormous difference. The payments, just sending money out to people. Um, Milton Friedman, early in his career, urged uh, fiscal stimulus, and they said probably the best way to do it was to just drop money from helicopters. Honestly, Milton Friedman. Like, this was before he had his, his uh, libertarian epiphany. But um, right. it... We don't, we could get, because we're seeing this third surge, which we, we were seeing an improvement when they did the last forecast. So they forecast that improvement to keep going. Well, now we're seeing a surge that could be worse than the original one. So like everyone ought to wear these things um, because we can really tamp down the impact of that. It's not about the government freezing the economy. It's people just don't go to restaurants People don't go out and spend money when they think they're going to die. Um, and that's what you're seeing in the economy. So the economy could get, or the predictions about the economy could get worse by December. They could get better. Um, but $4 billion out of a 50 or so billion dollar budget is, is real money, right? Uh, seven and a half, eight percent. Um, that sounds doable, but you're, we're not constitutionally able to cut our education expenditure. That's half the budget. It's unbelievably difficult to make substantive reductions in Medicaid. Um, that's another quarter. So now you're taking 8% out of 25%, which is like a third. I, you can't, that's, that's us, right? You can't do that uh, and still have a system left. And so they're not going to, they're, they're gonna spend money out of the rainy day fund, which uh, has $3 billion in it, which uh, I'm pleased that we got that done so that we actually have a cushion when we get these big shocks. But um, it's, they can, they can avoid, they're going to have to use all of those devices to, to move. And they're going to, I think they're going to need to raise revenue. Now, I'm not speaking for the governor here. This is Ross wearing his hat as a former budget guy. It's like, hmm. Looks like you probably got to raise some revenue here. I'm not sure I'm answering your question. And so, um, oh, I think so. Your strategic plan intentionally calls out and directs your agency to focus on addressing outcome disparities by race and ethnicity. Yep. As part of that response, your racial equity change team is charged with making suggestions about approaches that DCYF will take. Can you share who's on the racial equity change team and what types of recommendations they have made or will make and how you can be held accountable for implementing those changes? Well, we have, uh, we have a number of racial equity teams, uh, probably honestly more than you can count. Um, we have an internal team. We actually created a formal team that has three people on it uh, to where we brought people from different parts of the operation. Um, Gay Shogren of LaToya, Yvette, um, are tasked with helping organize this effort. We have outreach efforts that have lots of, lots of um, stakeholders on them, people, people who are interested in being on them, trying to be broadly representative of, of the community that we listen to. And we're going to listen people who make suggestions for there. But what I've found is that you actually have to structure the questions that you ask, or you get, you just get this sort of smorgasbord of stuff and you don't have a plan that gets you anywhere. And so our plan, where we're trying to present the strategic plan to folks to try and get them to understand, is this gonna work? Is this not gonna work? What would you do differently? It's probably a more structured way to get feedback from external groups. Um, 
every group we work with, and we have, I think, 49 formal advisor groups, ought to think about themselves as the racial equity change team. Because in almost every place that we work, racial equity has to be the original start place where you, where you just start thinking about the problem. Uh, outcomes for, for young children in childcare, outcomes in preschool, what does kindergarten readiness look like? Uh, the foster care system um, is one of the most terrifying. The juvenile justice, we're at the deep end of the juvenile justice system. So we see all of the historical racism that's baked into policing in America uh, gets delivered to our doorsteps. So at each one of these systems needs enormous amounts of change. And you've got to start thinking about race. Uh, I originally started thinking about how we did our plan, just starting with the outcomes for children. And I've talked to a lot of our staff internally. And what I found is people were sort of stuck. They couldn't get to where I was going. Well, we're going to do this investment in pre-K. We're going to target this population because they're historically underserved. That will, I, I got this math thing that I do to try and, and solve outcomes for kids. And what I've found is that we also have to do a huge investment in, the, in how we treat our internal staff. And it's a precondition for them to be able to do the delivery work, particularly in child welfare and juvenile justice, for us to fix problems that we have there. People have to feel like they're working for a fair organization. So we're doing a lot of change there. I, I listen. I know I can't rattle I'm realizing off. that I probably, yeah, I'm, I'm realizing that I probably should have um, framed this entire conversation with maybe your, um, for those who aren't terribly familiar with DCYF, with maybe your elevator speech for what DCYF is and what it does. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm starting my stopwatch every time because you white guys wanted me to stay to two minutes, which is super hard for me. <laughs> um, elevator speech is what we do is if, if you worry about kids, we're responsible for that problem. Um, that's sort of the, the really short speech because you really can't spend time in elevators with people today. But the little bit longer is um, we have three main parts to, to the three component parts that were brought together into an agency, which is the Department of Early Learning, which is focused on building a system for birth to five that supports kids. And that came in with a strategic goal of getting 90% of the kids in Washington to be ready for kindergarten. And that using a really broad measure that has uh, measures of, of sort of the social emotional health of children, their physical health, in addition to can they count. Um, but that, that was one piece we brought in. And the key element of that is that we wanted to be able to remove the predictability in that readiness based on race or on sort of socioeconomic standing. We also brought in the child welfare organization, uh, the Children's Administration, and juvenile rehabilitation. So um, foster care, the, all, all of CPS is part of what we do to try and keep kids safe. Uh, and then we have the, the juvenile correction system. It's hard to call it a juvenile justice system, the juvenile incarceration system. We have about 300, 300 or 400 young people, mostly young men, uh, that are formally sentenced by counties. And if they're sentenced to longer than 30 days, they wind up in our care and we'd like to launch them into the world um, so that they can be successful and so that that part of our system doesn't see them again. Um, we'd also like to take our uh, foster care system and cut it in half. Uh, you're not going to find a lot of state agencies that want to cut their book or business in half, but I want to cut that one in half. Okay. So, um... Since, since I've come into this role, and you know, I spent some time both in the early learning space and then in the K-12 space as an elected official. And um, since I've come into this role, I have heard uh, conversations where people allude to a binary choice between um, improving the quality of early learning in childcare and working for racial equity as though 
you can only choose one or the other. You can't have both. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about why you think this might be a false dichotomy and what your department is doing to bring together both a focus on racial equity and um, uh, uh, improvements in quality? Sure. So I always start my, my life thinking about if we do this, how will the world get better? And I'm really responsible for making the world better for kids. That, that's what we do. And uh, when, we, when you look at that, you look at, say you look at kindergarten readiness, uh, there's an enormous body of research on pre-K, part of what Early Achievers was based on. And it shows what are the elements that will predictably result in, in kids being better prepared to succeed in the K-12 system. Uh, and we wanted to build a system that delivered those attributes. Uh, and we wanted to focus that system on kids who need it most. Um, and in Washington, uh, you're not allowed to uh, do that by race um, from Initiative 200. You are allowed to do it by economics, which has the side effect of concentrating our investments in children of color to improve outcomes for that population, uh, to try and get everyone onto an even playing field when they get to K-12. So that's the place where we start. And we think that that is fundamentally about removing racial bias in the system. Um, we also believe that in order for that to work, we have to have a more diverse teaching core than we do in the K-12 system, which is about 90% monolingual white. Uh, and we're much more diverse than that. And so we wanted to, unique in America, we are building a strategy to try and grow the skills and abilities of our uh, existing childcare staff, our diverse childcare staff, so that they can be successful. And in fact, when you look at what we're doing with early achievers, our providers of color do better in their evaluations than our white providers. So I think we're being successful there, but anytime you, you sort of push your um, body of providers to provide higher quality, um, you're gonna get some pushback. I, I think here's a place where we're really trying to do, uh, to help people provide care for kids. My favorite experience of this is in a bargaining session I did with uh, the union that represents family childcare. We were doing the intros and we went around and we came to three young women from Yakima who spoke Spanish and had to be translated. And uh, it gave this great um, story about how the tools that they were getting from early achievers, they could see were really helping them work with kids from their community and that they were getting better outcomes and they, because they learned more and they were, they were better at being uh, teachers. And I, I think that's what we're trying to do. And we're trying to not do it in the way the K-12 system did. That, that said, you know that there's a lot of uh, dissension within the provider ranks, both around um, the fact that they are struggling mightily at this point. The, the latest study I saw said something like uh, 40 some odd percent of child care providers believe that they'll be out of business in the next um, few months without some sort of support. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's, you know, with uh, providers of color that I get a chance to speak to, there's a perception that um, they are they are, don't have sufficient resources to be able to live up to the um, increasing standards that are in place. And so there is some dissension that's out there that mm -hmm. um, we can't ignore. Nope. Um, I'd agree. We can't we can't ignore that dissension, and we try and, and be responsive to it. Um, the, I, I'm responsible for a lot of things in the world. Uh, the pandemic is not one of them. Uh, and we have tried mightily to respond to this to keep the childcare business running. Uh, really at the outside edge of my authority as, a, um, as an appointed agency head. You know, I'm not the legislature now. I don't get to determine the budget. So I have to live within the budget. We did a bunch of stuff to drive 
resources to stabilize the childcare market uh, starting in the spring uh, and working our way up until September. We uh, automatically increased everybody to, to full day because nobody was, was actually going to school and all those half day things needed to go to full day. We flipped how we were paying uh, to pay uh, based on um, enrollment rather than attendance. Uh, we did a lot of stuff. The legislature looked at that particular move and said, well, wait a minute, there should be a lot of savings because a lot of these kids aren't actually showing up. And had we taken that savings, I had some unpleasant meetings with legislative budget chairs, had we taken that savings, we would have bankrupted the whole system. So we're chosen, we, we also distributed some of the CARES Act money out into the community, trying to do it in a balanced way. And any time that you are giving out money, um, you're going to have dissension where this group thinks they should get more than that, or the formula should be this way. And that's sort of normal part of, of the business. We've tried to be fair in how we're distributing that money, but also use a rubric that where we could figure out the rules for distributing it in sort of non-geologically measured time, right? It takes me four months to build a computer system to distribute the money. It's sort of too late. We should. We had to get that money out by the end of the calendar year anyway. So we have a methodology we've given out about sixty million dollars in grants. Uh, it is essential not to prioritize getting back to normal when the existing early learning system doesn't work for all children, families, or providers. Um, what are your ideas for taking the first steps toward building a more robust and functional system? Okay. Um, and now I have two minutes. Okay. <laughs> um, so let's start off with the childcare system, which the economics of which are fundamentally broken. Um, it costs more to provide safe care to children than uh, most families who have young children can afford. And I'm not saying this like families at 30% of the federal part. No, no, no. Like most families, like 80% of the population can't afford what it costs to provide safe care, particularly if you have an infant or a toddler. Um, you know, we can make it cheaper by letting, you know, one teacher handle 10 infants, but that really sounds like a bad idea. Like that does not sound like that would have safe outcomes. So the way we solve this, because you have the same problem in kindergarten and first grade, is we, we have subsidy for it. Like the state has a public school system. In this case, we wanna have a much more mixed delivery system because what kids want, what families need uh, is very different. We think you ought to, we ought to do some work around the subsidy system so that uh, it's never more than seven to 10% of a family's income and that uh, providers actually get paid enough that they can pay their staff more than minimum wage so that they'd stay there for more than 20 minutes. Uh, and that we, you know, we build this big ecosystem around a really high quality uh, childcare system that gets paid enough. And the only way that's gonna happen is if we collectively decide as a community that we wanna pay for that as a community. So we're gonna need to have scholarships or however you wanna structure this to make this work, to have a functioning childcare system. Um, the, there just isn't enough money to do it and I can't spend money I don't have. Uh, we're trying to drive as much of our resource into the subsidized system because it serves the most needy families. But there's a whole bunch of families that hit a benefit clip. And we find that it happens right at around 32 to $35,000 a year in income uh, is that uh, all of a sudden, people's uh, copay goes up faster than their income does. And you get to a point where you say, I can't take that raise or I can't take that promotion because I'll lose my child care. And then you're stuck in the same job forever, right? It's like a structural barrier to getting out of poverty. And we want to eliminate that. We've been working with the Department of Commerce on work around the economics of that. That's the, sort of the key thing that I think the structural change that you could get in place in the legislature this year or next, even in the middle of a pandemic, is not to pay for all that all at once, but to set it up so that we grow, as we grow out of the recession, that's what the part that grows. Because we gotta do this. Um, kids need it and families need it so they can go to work. The economy yeah. needs it too. 
it is um, as perverse a thing as you can imagine when we say that the most important thing that we can do is to ensure that kids are ready for kindergarten so that they can be successful in kindergarten and beyond. And then we undercompensate their providers mm -hmm. um, during those years. It's the, the absolute wrong thing that you would do. And so I love the idea that you would build a system or that you would encourage the state to actually build a system um, and it's going to require a lot of additional funding that is not present right now. Not present right now. But now's the time when you could do the work because people are, legislators are going to be unhappy about what they're going to have to do in the budget. Right. And let's give them something to be happy about that isn't a 10 minute happiness, but is yeah. the, a gift that keeps on giving over the next decade of growing our way into a much more functional system. Because uh, what we have today is just not fair to, to families. It's not just providers who don't get paid enough. It's, uh, that is a problem. It's, you got families who can't get care because the economics don't work to right. provide care for families who are making $50,000 a year. I, the, it, it's, it costs you eighteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a year to have childcare. Like, you can't do that if you're making fifty grand a year. Really? Uh, so we've got to figure out that um, to make that work. Because if you got to go to work, um, but you can't afford to go to work because you, you can't afford the childcare, something's got to give. And what usually gives is you wind up with some sort of sketchy place where you have your kid that's really cheap. And it's like, why is it that cheap? Sometimes it's because it's your mom, right? That's a great answer. But not everyone has that answer. Right. Right. Let's go to the next question. Yeah, uh, the next question, uh, another pre-submitted one is from uh, Chris Carney. Um, looks like there's two people here named Chris. I'm not sure which one of you is Chris. <laughs> I'm the real Chris. <laughs> Hi. He's also Chris, but that's Chris King. <laughs> okay. And I, work uh, I can e read your question if you'd like, but go ahead and introduce yourself. I work for ESD 112 um, out of Vancouver. I'm a coach for early achievers and I work with family child care programs and uh, child care centers. Awesome. Now that makes total sense with your question. <laughs> uh, you asked, can you tell us what early achievers coaching services may look like going forward and uh, how the budget might affect early achievers and child care aware? Well, um, so child care aware is, um, we contract with them to provide coaching uh, which is one of the things that is most helpful in helping providers um, to be able to deal with the issues that come up and, and sort of work to improve quality is the, is the quality of coaching. Uh, and we've worked with them for better part of a decade now to, to build that relationship and build a strong coaching infrastructure around the state. I don't control the state's budget um, anymore. I, uh, I'm a control freak. I would love to control the state's budget. Um, I don't. Um, and so I don't know what they're going to do about it. We think it's really important to have that coaching. Um, it's because it, it is the sort of the best tool that we have to help providers start from where they are and get better in place. You know, we're not adding new requirements. We're adding help to people. Uh, so I value tremendously what you're doing. Uh, and we hear from providers that they like their coach. They, we hear too often that there's too much turnover in coaches, which uh, we would like to address. And um, that probably requires paying people more, um, which is unlikely to happen during this legislative session. Um, Christine is telling me shorter answers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna jump in real quick, Dan, and uh, follow up on that question. and. Note the fact that um, earlier today, starting at eight o'clock, there was a coalition of 67 child care um, organizations that advocate for child care in Washington state across the state that all met together. They're called the uh, Early Learning Action Alliance and Children's, Children's Alliance has the responsibility, the honor of facilitating this group and developing a legislative agenda for the upcoming legislative session. You know about this because um, they have been a, some, 
they've talked with your organization frequently and probably been critical of it at times. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm wondering um, if you can share your reflections about the value of a coalition like the ELA coalition and what it, how it can, how it can force your or push your agency to do some things that um, it would not otherwise do. So if we were filming this from my office in Olympia, um, I would have carefully arranged the backdrop to have one of my Wheaties boxes from the Early Learning Action Alliance, uh, where I was a legislative champion for a number of years. I only have one of the boxes left because I, I was worried about rodents. Um, having stale Wheaties seemed like a bad idea, but, um, but I don't go to Olympia right now. So I don't have my Wheaties box as a prop. Um, that kind of work drove a lot of the work to drive a lot of resources into early learning from the legislature. It's been uh, having a coordinated agenda instead of all 67 people asking for separate things all over the place. Uh, having a coordinated agenda means that you have more leverage and you get more of the Children's Alliance has done tremendous work over the years to make that better. And sometimes, yes, they are a thorn in my side. That is a good thing, right? The world needs more thorns. Um, to, to make the world better. Thank you for that. Uh, Dan, you can go ahead. Okay, um, I'm going to do another question here that is from uh, Jamie Ruth. Make sure you're still here. And uh, would you like to ask your question? Yes, thank you. Um, so my question was, when you were speaking earlier, you uh, mentioned that would certainly, um, I'm going to roughly quote, that would certainly bankrupt many programs or the system. And you were speaking about enrollment-based versus attendance-based subsidy. Recognizing that the enrollment-based subsidy has expired, moving forward, who will be most impacted in your, um, through your view? Um, based on that decision and um, commenting about bankrupting programs. Okay. So in March, we were look, we started collecting data about actual attendance um, in providers. We were to figure out, how, did they have enough spaces if we had a surge in hospitals and we were required to do something really dramatic to make sure that, you know, we had enough nurses. Um, fortunately, that did not come to play in Washington. Um, and what we found at the time was that about 40% of, we had a, a huge drop off of, in terms of providers were closed and of the providers that were open, only about 40% of the kids were showing up. So for subsidized kids, that meant you'd only get paid for that 40%. Um, we're now up to about 60%, 55, 60% varies by provider uh, of people who are attending. Um, so I'd love to continue that program. Uh, in order to do that, we depended on uh, proclamations from the governor that required unanimous consent from the legislature to continue. And that unanimous consent ended in August. Um, and so you can't really run everything by, you know, so I've been trying to push to not undo laws and undo the budget. Uh, if we want to change that, that needs to change in the budget uh, that the legislature passes. Uh, I would absolutely support going to that model. That's how normal people purchase childcare and uh, providers basically got to gotta leave a slot open. Uh, we've done some financial modeling on it. It's hard to predict exactly what it would cost, but I don't think it would be as expensive as, it, as you might otherwise think. Uh, but I think it's a, an important way to make sure that we are um, pushing out money out to the, to the ways in a world that gets the most care for children. Like I don't want to pay providers for if they're just holding spots open, right? But I do, because then, then there's a shortage of, of, for other people who do want the care. So it's sort of a balancing act, but I would love to continue that policy. Uh, in order to do that, I need the legislature and the Office of Financial Management to agree that we can do that in the budget.
Um, all right, I'm going to move on here. We have um, several similar questions that I'm going to uh, kind of group together. Um, we have uh, Janice Avery and Tom Quigley and Leslie DeZono and Angela Bagus all asked about um, what DC DCYF is doing uh, with that racial equity uh, work that you mentioned, um, with those advisory committees that you mentioned, um, talking about racial equity issues throughout the department. Uh, basically, they're asking what are uh, specific issues that you think need to be addressed and, and how will you continue to keep equity at the center? Well, we had originally planned to have uh, a racial equity plan that would be that would have been released at the end of the year. The COVID pandemic really um, dis distracted people because we had a lot of disasters to deal with uh, in the child welfare world, in juvenile rehab, uh, and in in childcare. You just heard about how we had to rejigger our finances by probably a couple hundred million dollars uh, over that six month period. Uh, to make it work. So what you're, what we're doing now, we've decided to do is to, uh, we're, our racial equity team is out doing, uh, a, they're not out doing a tour, they're doing a virtual tour to try and get feedback from all the groups to start from what we're getting and also fit it into how we're thinking about our overall strategic plan. We expect to roll the first draft of the strategic plan out, or the second draft out, again, uh, prior to the beginning of the legislative session, that will include our current feedback we've gotten from the field on the racial equity plan. We expect to get feedback from the legislature uh, and from everyone else at the time, uh, and then we'll finalize that uh, later this spring. You're gonna see some focus on our internal practice. You're gonna see some focus on setting targets in way and measurable targets in ways that actually uh, reduce the disproportionality, disproportionality in outcomes in early learning, in foster care, and in um, juvenile rehab. Uh, and, and you'll see some specific strategies about that. Sorry, are we ready to move on to the next question or did you have anything to add, Stefan? No, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, the next one we're going to do from uh, Munisha Carr, if you'd like to uh, ask your question. Um, if not, I will ask it for you. Yes. Hi, I'm Manisha Kaur. I'm an intern for Open Doors for Multicultural Families. And my question is, how does the DCYF plan to serve students of color with intersectional identities, particularly those with disabilities? Mm -hmm. um, so when you're talking about intersectional, um, so we might have a student who, or a young person who, if you're, if we're talking about teenagers, say, who self-identifies as um, lesbian uh, and is um, is black and is in uh, in the foster care system. That's one where we need to figure out how how all of our reactions to that don't step on each other and make, make everything better, not worse. Uh, and a lot of that's about how do we uh, teach our staff, how do we train our staff and get all of our staff in that system bought into uh, understanding the issues that young people present, uh, regardless of where that, you can't just say this kid's in this box. We have to understand what might happen? What might what might have been the experience of this child? What do they experience today or this young person? Um, when we look at, um, we'll see different intersectionality in really young kids, um, where we might have language issues at the same time. Or language issues. Some kids have a gift of having multiple languages. How do we have that? How do we have that work? And understand how that intersects with the race of the provider. Uh, and, and our system overall in early learning, how do we deal with uh, bilingualism, trying to get all of that stuff to, to be thoughtful uh, is challenging. And we're not going to get it right every time. Uh, and so one of the things we do depend on is hearing from the community uh, 
about when we didn't get it right. That's that thorn I talked about is we get poked about it and say, oh yeah, we're not doing this right. Okay, what are we gonna do differently? Um, and so we need to get a lot of feedback from folks about how are the things that we're doing playing out with specific, um, specific young people. Kids are all different. They, you, know, you can't just say this is a black kid or an American Indian kid. Um, this is a kid and they happen to be black and they, they might be lesbian or they might be transgender or they might be some other thing. We have to deal with the kid the way the kid is. Um, I don't really know how to give a specific answer to that question. And I'm going to follow up a little bit um, on that question um, because it brings up a couple different issues. You know, you've been, you're the leader of a statewide agency and you've been a leader in the state legislature. And there are many people on this call that are advocates for for kids in their community, maybe kids in their individual family or someone that they know. Um, in your experience, what's the best way to advocate for individual children or children that live in your neighborhood or children that are part of your community or part of your identity group? What's, what do you find is the most effective way to be an advocate uh, for those types of children? Well, and you can start it small um, and you could decide how much, you know, like how big is your problem? Is, is it that this kid needs a baseball glove so that they can, uh, this foster kid needs a baseball glove because they want to play on their middle school baseball team and they don't have any equipment. And how are we going to make that happen? Um, and we have nonprofits that work in that space. The state will provide some of that stuff. That particular example is one that I happened to drive that kid from one place to another and we found a baseball glove. Thank you, Treehouse. Um, but so you can like make sure that kid has what they need. Either the community provides, you can poke at us as an agency to do that. Um, I, I do respond to my email, uh, though I probably can't deal with baseball gloves for 9,000 children. I, ideally 4,500 children, um, you can move up a level and, and develop a relationship with your legislator in your community. Um, and that's really important. They want to talk to you. Honestly, if you're a voter in their district, they will be happy to have coffee with you. You may not believe this, but if you're one of the people that bugs them about issues, you represent hundreds of people in their district and they want to listen to you. Um, they, will, they will do it. That's just, it's in their interest. Um, and then they can help you do that. You can also be part of a group that is more organized and focused on perhaps narrower but more leveraged issues. And I'd say the Children's Alliance is a big one, but there's lots of other groups with more specific interests that you have to help force spending decisions, which is really what drives the services that we need. And I don't think we talk enough about um, children with disabilities. Can you speak mm -hmm. to advocacy for children with disabilities? Yeah, we're, um, give you an example, right now we're struggling to try and figure out how do we provide an adequate education to children in um, our juvenile facilities. And uh, what we're doing now is um, patently inadequate. Um, an enormous number of kids in juvenile rehab uh, either have an IEP uh, or should have an IEP, sort of a, a special ed plan for, for that kid. And how do we ensure that uh, our system actually you know, supports that? Uh, it's really, uh, really important for us to do that. Um, so I'm struggling with that structurally, but, but your advocacy has got to be Families that have kids with disabilities often struggle because they're so busy trying to take care of and helping to represent that the needs of that family structurally into our system is really important because they don't necessarily have a voice. And so you can be that voice with all those other people I talked about in my last two minute answer. Dan. All right. Um, yeah, I'm going to move on. There's uh, two similar questions from uh, Nimco Bilale and uh, Angela Bagas, who both asked about um, 
multicultural and immigrant children and families, uh, children and families who maybe don't have English as a first language, um, how to support those families with childcare and education specifically? Well, so again, I don't run the K-12 system. Um, we think, uh, and we've thought this for a long time, we thought this before I came into the system, we still think this, uh, is that uh, kids learn best, uh, particularly really little kids, uh, in their home language. And we want to make sure we empower providers to offer uh, programs in Somali, programs in, uh, in Spanish, programs in Russia, whatever language is, is a, the providers. Families will often seek out uh, a child care provider that speaks their language in, in the role. Their kids will develop that literacy better. They'll develop better language skills by learning one language deeply. Uh, they'll learn English when they hit kindergarten or they'll learn language when they're on the playground with kids because that's what little kids do. Uh, but, so we're really doing a lot of work to do bilingual work with our providers to enable that. Uh, we're also doing that with the tribes, putting a, a lot of effort into uh, our original languages here in Washington, uh, the Shootseed, and uh, to try and to do that work has been also really powerful because kids get anchored in their community by, by having that, that gift of multiple languages it also makes them more flexible. Um, and I don't think all of the programming languages that I learned when I was in college as a computer science major count in terms of adding flexibility to my thinking. Um, but having two languages where you can think, oh, I'd say it like this in Spanish, but this in English, ooh, which one of those things says what I want to say better is a, is a powerful gift to children, and we want to support that. I'm going to move on to uh, another combined question. Um, we had two people, uh, Samantha Anderson asked about uh, specifically the education and child care system for children birth through five. And uh, Carrie Sanders asked about the same system for uh, the child care system for school age children. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think are going to be the different impacts on those different age groups in terms of uh, child care and the child care budget? I don't know. Um, a lot of the money that we spend on both of those systems, on the subsidy system, is federal money. Uh, and that's unlikely to be affected by this budget. Um, the federal system, the concepts of revenue and expenditures don't seem to be relating concepts at the federal level. Um, a, a discussion for a, a different day and a different audience, perhaps. Yeah. But um, the, because I think they should be at some point. Um, but so in Washington, most of that money is, is coming. But we do have a lot of general fund, and that's at risk. <laughs> um, we don't really have a deterministic way of saying, does it go to after school programs, or does it go to um, programs for birth to five, though almost all of our licensed capacity is in the birth to five space. So most of the money gets spent there because you, you only need after school care, or you used to only need after school care. Now people will need full day care, and that is going to be profoundly more expensive. <coughs> Right. Um, I think we probably only have time for one more question. Um, I'm going to say we have a question here from Renee Murray. Um, would you like to introduce yourself and ask your question to wrap us up? Yeah, sure I would. Um, well, Secretary Hunter, I've just, it, it, even though I know it's not budgetarily possible right now, but I'm actually curious about the appetite for DCYF to begin to have a vision for, for youth development. Um, you know, I've talked about this before, but, you know, putting expanded learning, mentoring, and wraparound services into a vision for sustaining the gain from that early learning investment for children, um, school age to young adult, and just wondering about where you think that could land. Um, it's a big topic. So the, the question is really, it's about how do we take on um, the needs of 
young people who are sort of school age and maybe moving into the teen, teen years. Um, and the way Washington's set up is the education system is the K-12 system's responsibility, uh, which is uh, scattered out to 295 different school districts. Um, we're gonna start ours with something that we think is a little bit more doable, uh, which is one of our strategic goals is about how do we launch children in our care. Uh, and so I think the, the first group that you look at of young people in our care, or to say children, is children in juvenile rehabilitation facilities. Um, we want to make sure that we have an education system that gives them the tools so that when they leave, they have a high school diploma, they're engaged in post-secondary education so that they can get a job that actually pays them enough to have housing. Uh, we want to do the same thing for teenagers who are in foster care. Um, there are uh, a small number of, of young people who age out of the foster care system every year, uh, go into extended foster care. Uh, we absolutely want to make sure that we're supporting those young people. In fact, we got a great grant from the Commerce Department that and we helped a lot of them with housing this year because we were worried that they'd lose their housing as a result of losing their jobs in, in retail or in um, food service. Uh, so trying to make sure that all those kids are stabilized is, is really important. Kids who are graduating from that. So again, it's do they have enough education? Do they have um, sort of all of the supports necessary around them to do that? And some of that is going to be how do they how do we get services into kids and families um, where they may have sort of dysfunctional dynamics in the family? So you'll see us working to bring a lot of evidence-based programs into that space using the new Family First Prevention Services Act money from the federal level to try and improve the quality and the availability of in-home services for families who have either youth with challenging behaviors and or youth with challenging behaviors because the behaviors of the adults in the family are very challenging. How do we help them build a more positive relationship so that the young person has the ability to blossom into the world. So we're going to start with the kids that we're really responsible for, and we'll see where we go from there. I, I try not to take on too big a bite at once. So um, I'm really appreciative of um, all that you shared with us, Secretary Hunter, and I feel bad in the sense that um, I know that there are lots of questions that were um, generated that we're not going to get around to um, I did hear you say something about uh, collaborating with me to answer those questions and get those back out to people. Yep. And so uh, we will follow up and um, all those who didn't get a chance to ask a question that's burning in your mind, um, stay tuned because we'll get back to you on that. We'll give you an opportunity to re-engage with the Children's Alliance um, in order to get the answer to your question. There you go. The Children's Alliance there. does such good work in the world um, that we want, to, we want to give you as many opportunities as possible to engage with them. Absolutely. And, well, you know, the truth of the matter is we have been blown away by the response uh, to this opportunity to talk with, you know, a, a serious policymaker. And we're trying to figure out, can we do this on a more regular basis? And I suspect that we can if we allocate the time. Because the theory of action for the Children's Alliance is we want to inform the communities and the people who care about these issues to join with us in pushing government to prioritize the kids that we care about the most. And so we will be back in touch with everyone that is participating in this call. And um, I just want to say as the, you know, executive director of the Children's Alliance, I've been on board for four months now, uh, just how inspired I am that there are so many of us that are that care about other people's kids and want to collaborate and partner to try to improve outcomes for kids. So we are working hard inside of the Children's Alliance and we're hoping that you will continue to engage with us. And so we'll be reaching out over the course of the next few weeks and months to um, see how willing you are to help us with that. And with that, I want to turn it back over to our board chair who can close us out for this event. Can I just say one thing, from oh, please, Savan, which please, is, quickly. so all of you out there, get in some good trouble this year, because we need that.
This is a year to get in good trouble, there's no doubt. Well, thank you, Secretary Hunter. Thank you, Stefan. I welcome everybody to use their little reactions to give a little hand and a little thumbs up for their um, conversation. Um, was really great. I think Stefan already said everything. Um, there'll be opportunity to answer questions. There'll be a survey that's gonna come out. So ask your questions then. Uh, there's recordings of this event. And so um, if you need them, reach out to us. We'll make sure that you have them. You can share them with everybody. Thank you for joining us and giving us your lunch hour and have a great of your, the rest of your day.